The fabric of the global internet is a rich weave of people and ideas. There are 1.1 billion of us online. It seems everyone's on the internet, but we know that's not really so. Fact is, for every one of us connecting to the World Wide Web, there are five others who are not yet plugged in. People in remote areas, people who can't afford it, and people who have other priorities. So while many of us can't imagine our lives without the internet, more than 80% of the world is not online. This gap is known as the digital divide. It's the chasm between the haves and have-nots, or as some call them, the electronic elite and the information poor. Affordable access to the internet and training in its use and benefits can be important and empowering for the poor, the undereducated, and those who live in remote regions. This is called digital inclusion. The Digital Opportunity Index, produced by the International Telecommunication Union, is the most comprehensive measure of internet access. The map tells the story clearly. It's no surprise that the US and Canada, much of Europe, Japan, South Korea, and Australia have the highest percentages of their populations online, while least developed regions of the world, such as Africa and large parts of Asia and South America, are the low access zones. We know that being connected to the internet brings people knowledge, and knowledge is power. The world can be bettered by digital inclusion, a movement to knock out the digital divide. That's one of the reasons people are here in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil at the second annual Internet Governance Forum facilitated by the United Nations. This is a place where people from civil society, business, government, and non-governmental organizations can learn from one another, make global connections, and share information that will shape the way the internet expands. And one of the biggest topics here is access. Many initiatives are underway today to make the internet available and affordable to more people. What are the factors that are keeping people offline? What I'm concerned about and what I want to focus on in this meeting will be in, in other infrastructure criticalities like power, available electrical power, communications uh, infrastructure, uh, the uh, availability of trained personnel to run components of the internet. In my area, in, my, in Africa, in Kenya, where I come from, there is lack of knowledge of what you can do with the internet, even when it's there. Uh, the, the economic development in these countries is so different from, from our own, and uh, therefore, of course, the question of the whole infrastructure in general, but also the infrastructure in communication always comes up. The most obvious reason many people from around the world can't connect is related to infrastructure. When you look at the world's major internet backbones of connection, the fiber networks that tie together regional and national networks, you find that all the major electronic pathways have roots in the most developed countries. If you live in an area where telecommunications companies or governments have not made infrastructure investments, access can be a problem. The world is becoming more wired, but it takes time and money. Current projects are running fiber optic cables to provide reliable data connections for the first time to 22 Eastern, Central, and Southern African countries. But other islands, mountainous areas, and deserts will have to wait longer. Wiring the world is a huge job. Yeah, of course I'm from a developing country, like Bangladesh. So I always expect that internet should be for the rural people. As much as possible, it should be covered for the uh, local people at the people living in the village level, not only because at this moment we are seeing that the internet is for the rich and affordable people, yes. not for the who cannot provide, who cannot afford. Even if you could run cables to all areas, does it make economic sense to do so? Companies often have no prospect of signing up enough customers in poor, sparsely populated rural areas to cover their costs. We should take into account the issue of the affordability for the developing countries. So this is another aspect of COIN. So how to strike the balance so that there will be a win-win kind of situation. Private sectors will be encouraged to continue to develop, have innovations, while at the same time, and the developing countries will have the access. In developing areas, uh, two main factors are the high cost of connectivity and the lack of connectivity access, in, especially in rural areas. And the key factor that really keeps people offline entirely of ICT uh, potential is uh, unreliable access to electricity. 
where it might not make sense for a corporation to make the investment for internet connectivity in some areas, there are calls for government to step in and provide help. Just as the U.S. government subsidized the telephone and electric companies that ran services to rural areas in the early 1900s. But for many nations, this is controversial. Faced with challenges of inadequate roads, water, and electricity systems, and only rudimentary health and education systems, how can developing data networks be a priority? We want access to be improved, but at the same time, we want to ensure that that access is coming where there's an environment of openness in terms of the information that people are receiving. Those who believe in the power of the internet argue that access to the free flow of information can be a catalyst to improving the quality of life. There is very good impact by the underserved and the underdeveloped people because uh, they can use the internet uh, for their economical development, for their personal and the human development, and also for the nation building. So internet is almost is very important for the developing countries. There is evidence that even community access to a single internet connection can make a difference. Imagine the power that a single internet kiosk can have in a poor rural community, providing information about such things as farming techniques, government aid, or basic health care. This is the knowledge-based society. And the huge, huge thing can be, uh, 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 can be acquired through knowledge transfer and knowledge dissemination. And it's a, a, a global society is now knowledge-based. In the areas where I have most experience, for example in East Africa, there's a lot of a discussion at the moment on whether uh, information regarding uh, uh, agricultural services, not just prices, but also agricultural practices spread through both the internet and mobile devices, mobile phones, uh, can have uh, quite a lot of impact in not just accessing new markets, but also in innovating on the agricultural practices. Emerging technologies may help knock down the barriers to access and sweep aside many of the infrastructure and cost questions. The One Laptop Per Child initiative has inspired the development of an internet-ready computer that costs under $200. It comes with software and a hand crank for power generation in remote locations. Many see the phone as the future of the internet in remote locations. Mobile telephones that are being developed to include email and internet capabilities are seen as a valuable alternative to computers because they can provide essential access in remote areas at a low cost. The United Nations Millennium Villages Project is implementing a plan to provide cell phones to 79 villages in 10 African countries. The program is based on a 2005 study that showed providing just 10 mobile phones per 100 people could significantly improve economic output and boost the economy. About 400,000 people will be provided with access to mobile communication and the internet through this initiative. If there is an attention to the needs of a specific community in terms of listening to what it is that they could be potentially benefiting from and helping them achieve that in terms of uh, training and a uh, little bit of help in trying to connect to the resources that might be helpful for them to begin with. That can have a huge spillover effect because then once they realize the potential, then the opportunities can only grow. When people at the Internet Governance Forum discuss access, they are also discussing cross-border regulations of internet connections, the cost of extending the internet and who will pay for it while keeping access affordable national policies regarding people's fair and equitable access to the internet, and network neutrality, a phrase used to describe the idea that all people should be able to access all information on the internet with no gatekeepers, creating any barriers or inequalities for anyone anywhere in regard to connecting with content. With advanced countries continuing to progress towards third-generation internet technologies, potentially leaving the least developed world even further behind, it is more important than ever to look for ways to provide access for all who would benefit. If we can't find a way to develop the fullest digital inclusion possible, we risk leaving people behind in a global economy that demands connectivity. Being off the grid is simply no longer an option. Reporting from Rio de Janeiro, I'm Ann Nicholson for Imagining the Internet in Elon University School of Communications.